Hmm. Pardon me. On the path to truth, there is only one true method. Calculation. Let's calculate some more derivatives. We've been discussing the product rule. This tells us that the derivative of the multiplication of two functions f and g is given by the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. This is the first maybe non-intuitive fact in calculus. Instead of the derivative of the product just simply being f prime times g prime, there's this more complicated formula that's telling us how the rate of change depends on f and g. There's a companion to the product rule called the quotient rule. Here it is. It says that the derivative of the quotient, the fraction, f over g, is given by this big formula. Now, it looks like a mess at first, but let's try to sort through it. First of all, notice that the numerator, the top of that fraction, is exactly the same as in the product rule, except for this minus sign. You have to be really careful. The minus sign is applied to the product of f and g prime. So it's when you take the derivative of the bottom that you get a minus sign. The first term is the same as in the product rule. It's just f prime times g. And then you need to divide by g of x squared. That's just what the quotient rule says. Let's see an example of the quotient rule in action. Here we're going to take the derivative of x squared plus 3x plus 1 and divide it by x cubed minus x. So in terms of the formula above for the quotient rule, f of x would be the numerator top of the fraction, and g of x would be x cubed minus x. That's the denominator, the bottom of the fraction. Now we're going to need the derivatives of those functions, so let's just go ahead and take those here. f prime, the derivative of f will be 2x plus 3, and g prime, the derivative of g, will be 3x squared minus 1. The derivatives of polynomials are easy. That just comes from the power rule applied to each term. Now let's apply the quotient rule. So let's copy down f prime times g minus, that's that all-important minus sign between the two terms, f, which is x squared plus 3x plus 1, times g prime, which is 3x squared minus 1. Okay. Good. Now the bottom was g of x squared, so we need to take x cubed minus x squared. And there's the quotient rule in action. Now we just need to do the algebra to simplify. Now often when you apply the quotient rule, you get something that looks like a completely horrible mess, but I encourage you just to persevere, be patient, and just work carefully. Work through everything term by term. Use good handwriting. Make your work neat. So here I've taken the product of 2x plus 3 times x cubed minus x. And now we'll do the same thing here. First I'll multiply x squared, 3x, and 1 by 3x squared but with that minus sign up front. So we have minus 3x to the fourth, minus 9x cubed, minus 3x squared. Awesome. And then we'll multiply the same three terms by minus 1. That is the effect of just changing this minus sign out front to a plus for those terms. So we just get plus x squared plus 3x plus 1. There you have it. And then I'm going to show the steps here for squaring x cubed minus x. It'll be the usual sort of foil game, like that. All right. Now, when you have something so large like this, you really have to be careful as you combine terms. So here we go. Let's 
add together the powers of x that are the same, we have 2x to the fourth minus 3x to the fourth. So that's a minus x to the fourth. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to underline the terms that I've already accounted for in that next line. The reason I do this is that I'm guaranteed not to miss anything. So 3x cubed minus 9x cubed will give minus 6x cubed. And then I'll underline those terms because we've combined them and put them into the answer below. Next up, we have minus 2x squared minus 3x squared plus x squared. That gives minus 4x squared. So let's underline those terms. OK. And now, yeah, I've got to be really careful with fractions. That line has to continue far enough to uh, fit the entire answer. Next up, we have minus 3x plus 3x. Those are the only x terms, and they completely cancel. OK, so they're not even going to appear in the line below. And then finally, we have the plus 1, which just stays the same. There it is. So all the terms have been underlined or crossed off. They've all been accounted for. Now we just need to multiply out x cubed minus x times x cubed minus x. x cubed times x cubed is x to the sixth. We add the exponents up. We'll have a minus x to the fourth coming from the inner terms. But then there's another minus x to the fourth coming from the outer terms. So that's minus 2 x to the fourth. And then we have minus x times minus x. That's plus x squared. And there's no more simplifications that we can really do here. And that's the derivative. This is Special Agent Dale Cooper. Hey, Gary Cooper? Agent Cooper. Hey. FBI. Right. <laughs> In the next example, our fraction involves a polynomial. That just involves x or powers of x. That's what I mean by a polynomial. But the denominator, that's 5 to the x. It's not x to the fifth. So then when we take the derivative of this function using the quotient rule, let me write out all the steps for you. We'll be taking the derivative of the top. That's the derivative of x minus 1 times the bottom, 5 to the x, minus the top. That's x minus 1 times the derivative of 5 to the x. And now in the denominator, we have to square that entire function. So we'll be taking 5 to the x squared. Now for this piece right here, the derivative of 5 to the x, we have to remember our rule for the derivatives of general exponential functions. So let me write that on the side over here. How do you compute that? Remember the derivative of a to the x, where a is a number, a constant, it is the natural log of a times a to the x. So we're going to use that formula here as we evaluate f prime. First off, we have the derivative of x minus 1. That's just 1. I won't even write it. That just gives 5 to the x for the first term. Then we have minus x minus 1 times the derivative of 5 to the x by this formula. That's the natural log of 5 times 5 to the x. OK, and what about 5 to the x squared? Remember, when you're taking an exponential and raising it to another power, that outer exponential, the outer exponent, comes inside and just multiplies. In other words, 5 to the x squared is just 5 to the 2x. You can also think of that as just 5 to the x times 5 to the x. The exponents add. So there's our answer. Um, we will actually be able to simplify in this case, though, because there's a common factor of 5 to the x. We can factor out 5 to the x from itself. That just leaves 1. And then let's also write all the terms here. So we'll have minus x times ln of 5 plus ln of 5. Very good. All right, and then in the denominator, we'll have 5 to the 2x. Now, in this case, maybe we shouldn't have combined the two copies of 5 to the x, because as we can see, we're going to be able to cancel one of them with the 5 to the x in the numerator. Or you can just think about that cancellation as being 5 to the x minus 
2x, all on a single exponent. However you want to think about it, we end up with the same numerator, but without the 5 to the x, divided by just 5 to the x. Now notice that I moved the natural log of 5 over to be with the 1. There's no real reason for that. I just wanted the constants to be all together and then the single x term to be second like that. That's just a matter of taste. It doesn't really matter. Okay, that's the derivative. There's a lady with the log. I would call it a log lady. Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Hang on. Sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Milford. We're now going to use the quotient rule to understand the derivatives of the trig functions. First recall the definitions of tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. They're given by these various fractions involving sine and cosine. Tangent is sine over cosine, cotangent is cosine over sine, secant is 1 over cosine, and cosecant is 1 over sine. That's just what they are. You should have all those memorized. You should know exactly the meanings of these four trig functions in terms of sine and cosine. Now, we already know that the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of cosine is minus sine. Here are the derivatives of the other four trig functions. There they are. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. The derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant squared. The derivative of secant is secant times tangent, and the derivative of cosecant is minus cosecant times cotangent. Now you can memorize all of these if you wish. It's a good idea. I think you'll find that as you practice using them, you'll end up memorizing them just through repeated use. But the point I want to make here is that if you ever forget the derivatives of these four functions, which to be perfectly honest, I do all the time, then you can just rederive them from scratch using the quotient rule. In fact, that's what I do if I have to use these derivatives more often than not. I just rederive them. Okay, so well, maybe before we do that, there are a few patterns here. I've set things up so that all of the co functions, cosine, cotangent, cosecant, are on the right, and then the corresponding functions without the co are on the left. Notice that the derivatives of the co-functions all have a minus sign, okay? And then notice that each function is swapped with its co-version as you move left to right. So there is a little bit of method to the madness here. There are some patterns. All right, let's do the derivative of cosecant just to give an example of how to derive these from scratch using the quotient rule. So we'll be computing the derivative of cosecant. Right. What's the derivative of cosecant of x? Well, by definition, cosecant is 1 over sine. So to find the derivative of cosecant, I just need to apply the quotient rule to 1 over sine. What do we get? Well, if it'll be a big fraction, we'll be taking the derivative of the top. That's 1 times the bottom, minus the top, that would be 1, times the derivative of the bottom, sine of x. All right, that is the numerator in the quotient rule. The denominator is the bottom function, sine of x, squared. So now let's expand. The derivative of 1, that's just 0. So that whole first term, since 1 is a constant function, there's no rate of change, that whole first term is 0. So we have a minus 1 times the derivative of sine. The derivative of sine is cosine. So we have minus cosine on top. And then on the bottom, we have sine of x squared. Now, I would usually write that as sine squared of x, but now I'm actually going to separate it out into two terms. 
sine of x times sine of x. And that's because I want to recognize that if we take a single copy of sine in the bottom, and we combine it with the cosine, since on the bottom we're multiplying, those two factors together combine to give cotangent. Remember, cotangent is cosine over sine. It's the reciprocal of tangent. So that means that we can rewrite this as minus 1 over sine. But wait, what's 1 over sine? Well, that would be cosecant. So we'll also use the fact here that cosecant is 1 over sine. So together, these two facts, together with the minus sign, give you minus cosecant of x times cotangent of x. And that's exactly what we had before. So this is how to derive the derivatives of trig functions. Once you already know that the derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of cosine is minus sine, you can derive the derivatives of all the other trig functions using the quotient rule. Oh, it fell down. Let's compute the derivative of the function 1 over x to the 7 times secant of x plus 5. There's actually two ways to proceed. They end up being equivalent. Of course, they have to give the same answer, because mathematics is consistent. That's one of the points of studying mathematics. It's a perfect, crystalline, pure, consistent, system of truth, capital T truth. Okay, so since we're dividing by x to the seventh, we could write the function that way. So it looks like a function of x divided by another function of x, and then we would use the quotient rule. But instead of doing that, I prefer to write the function an alternative way so that I don't have to use the quotient rule. Quotient rules, it's kind of messy, right? I don't really want to do that for this function if I don't have to. Instead, I'm going to think of that first function, 1 over x to the 7, as just x to the minus 7. Okay, and the second part will stay the same. I prefer to take the derivative this way using the product rule. Either one is fine. They'll both give you the same answer. But today we're going to evaluate using the product rule. You might try using the quotient rule just to see that, in fact, you end up getting the same answer. I just want to emphasize you can use either one, either the quotient or the product rule for this problem. Okay, let's use the product rule. To find that derivative, we'll be taking the derivative of the first function, x to the minus 7, times the second function, plus, remember it's a plus in the product rule, the first function, x to the minus 7, times the derivative of secant of x plus 5. Groovy. Alrighty, derivative of x to the minus 7, that's just our old friend, the power rule. It's becoming very familiar by now. Bring the exponent down, subtract 1. And then the second term, nothing happens. We just get secant of x plus 5. Okay, next up, we got x to the minus 7, and we need to take the derivative of secant. So remember, from the last page, the derivatives of the trig functions, the derivative of secant is secant of x times tangent of x. And in fact, that's the entire derivative here because we're adding 5, and 5 is a constant. The derivative of this term is 0. It doesn't contribute anything. So we get just the derivative of secant, which is secant times tangent. All right, now this is the answer. Um, we could leave it like that if we like. But there are some common terms, so let's just factor them for fun. Uh, we have a common term of x to the minus 7, it looks like. So we can write this 
sort of like how the first, how the original function was given to us as a 1 over x to the 7. That's the x to the minus 7 term. And then we'll have a, a minus 7 times secant of x plus 5 divided by x. That's this term here. I've just taken x to the minus 8. That would be a 1 over x to the 8. And since we factor out x to the 7, there's x left over. This term already has that x to the minus 7 alone, so all that's left is secant of x times tangent of x. So we could write the answer that way if we like. Um, I don't know. Actually, now that I've done that, I'm not so sure that this is any nicer than what was above. So if you want to leave it like this, that's just fine, really. There are plenty of other deaths in Twin Peaks. Yes, but only one has a best friend with one arm. Harry? <coughs> In the heat of the investigative pursuit, the shortest distance between two points is not necessarily a straight line. 